Thank you. We read this morning from the 11th chapter of Mark. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage and to Bethany at the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead, saying to them, Go into the village, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If any ask why, are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back shortly. So they went and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. They untied it, and some people standing there said, What are you doing untying that colt? And they answered just as Jesus had told them to. The people let them go when they brought the colt to Jesus. They put their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. People spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked at everything, but since it was late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The word from the Lord in the house of the Lord. Lent is an artificial thing that was created by the church. It represents the time that Jesus spent in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And the Bible says it was 40 days. But I've lectured you enough on the fact that 40 is just a number in the Bible. It's long enough for it to have happened. Not necessarily the right number of days, but long enough. And what we're supposed to do with Lent, according to the original intent, was we give up something. And then we take the money that we didn't spend on something and we give it to the church. We're good at raising money, you know. <laughs> and if any of you have some left over that you saved from Lent, just bring it up, bring it up. <laughs> I'm here to accept it all. I made a statement several weeks ago that I had a goal for Lent that I was going to lose four ounces a day. which I'm not doing very well on because we keep having company that likes to eat three meals a day and so do I. And let me tell you, our grandson was with us for a couple, three days and we went shopping. We went to Smith and I had a coupon. Buy two packs of Oreo double stuff <laughs> and save a dollar. He went back to school yesterday or this morning, I guess, we took him to Vegas last night. And if he hadn't gone to school, I'd had to go shopping again. <laughs> Two ain't near enough. But what is important about Palm Sunday is not so much the triumphal entry. That we're happy about. That people celebrated because they had seen the miracles that he had produced. They had heard the sermons that he had preached. They'd seen the healings that he had done, and they were all excited. And so they were willing to throw their coats on so that the king of kings didn't have to touch the ground. But once he got to Jerusalem, they went on about their business and left him and the 12 disciples in the temple in Jerusalem who then looked at the sky and said, it's getting dark, we have to walk back to Bethany. And it's quite a trip. It's, a, it's down through the valley and up to the far hillside from Jerusalem where they went to spend the rest of the week. And you notice, we do things on Thursday, we do things on Friday, we do things on Sunday. There's no mention about Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We don't know what we're supposed to do with those. There's no, there's no direction in the Bible of what those days are supposed to be like. They ought to be like any other Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. They ought to be filled with life. And that's what, that's what this day, this week, this whole thing is all about. It's, it's about all this holiness, but life gets in the way of our holiness. Life messes with us. Just when we think we've got things figured out, life happens again. And we start over. Yeah, it's, it's medical, it's financial, it's family, it's 
everything. But God gave us Christ to do the one task that he came for. The reading from Isaiah was the prognostication of exactly how Jesus was to die. Yeah, he gave his cheeks to them and they tore his beard out by the roots. He gave his back to them and he, they beat him with a, with a whip that had steel at the end of it that just ripped his flesh. He died that we might, he died that we might live. And in the, in the process of giving us eternal life, he encourages us to live daily life. Every day is a special day. Every day is, is so much that we don't need to cram it all into, into weekends or Sundays or, or special events on Thursday. Life is every day, and Christ died that we might have it. His death gave, gives us life eternal, but his demonstration gives us life every day because he did the things that he did from Palm Sunday until he was to be put to death on the weekend, the same as he'd always done. I'm sure that he taught his disciples. I'm sure that he had lunch with his disciples. I'm sure that he went to the garden to pray all by himself. He did the things that were part of his life. And he expects us to do the things that are part of our life with him in mind. Because he didn't die just so that we could have a party on Sunday and have some lilies on the, on the uh, communion rail or any of that stuff. He died to remind us that life is precious. Every day of life is precious. Every day that you have with those around you is precious. And it's special, and it's even more special when he's part of it. When he's significant in your life. So he didn't die to cause a celebration. He didn't die to cause us great anguish. He died that we might be set free from the things that bother us. Now I'm sure each and every one of you for Lent has done the, the noble and honorable thing of giving something up. Or even more honorable, taking something new on. Help a friend. Touch a life. Bring joy, even briefly, to someone. That's what Christ wants us to do. He's not a, he's not a God of, of giving up. He's a God of growing up. He's a God of building up. He's a God of pumping up so that we can be all that he would have us be in his name. And you don't have to run down the street in sackcloth and ashes celebrating that we gave up something, we did something. No. We need to celebrate because he did something. We need to note what it is that he did in our life, what he does in our life, what he'll always do in our life. Because he died to make men holy. I think I, we just sang. I love the Easter hymns because there's so much joyful theology in them. There's so much joyful message in them. Oh, we, can, we got some hymns that we can sing that are pretty much dirges, but we don't like those. Because we don't want to think about that part of Christ, about that part of his death. Rather, we want to think about his victory. Because his victory is my victory. His victory is your victory. He didn't do this for everyone. He did it for each one. And each one needs to be ready to celebrate whatever it is that the new day brings. Whatever it is that tomorrow is worth to us is a celebration. We should put him in our minds. We should put him on the back of that donkey. The donkey is a symbol of the winner. See, when a king went off to war, and he took his army and he went off to war, 
when he came back from war, if he came back on his horse riding fast, you knew it was bad news because he got beat. But if he came back on a donkey, he was coming back slowly and victorious. Not chased by an enemy, but followed by his victorious army. So Christ rode in victorious, even though what he was to face was beyond our comprehension. He came victorious for me. Live life for him. He gave life to you. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to sing it.